On April 30th, 1789, George Washington stood on the balcony of Federal Hall in New York City to take the oath of the office of the first president of the United States. The atmosphere was charged with anxiety. Washington himself was unsure if he was able uh, to take the task ahead. He reminded everyone that keeping the sacred fire of liberty alive was now their responsibility. Many people in the audience shared his worries, but they also had faith in him to bring the new constitution to life. The new government started forming in 1788, right after nine states ratified the constitution. State legislatures picked their new senators and organized elections for the House of Representatives. Most states also chose their presidential electors, except for Pennsylvania and Maryland, where voters made their decision. George Washington was the unanimous choice for president and John Adams became vice president. Congress set up three main departments, Treasury, State and War, following the old Confederation government. The Treasury was the biggest because managing financial uh, matters was crucial. Washington asked Alexander Hamilton, his trusted aide, to lead it. Thomas Jefferson, who had been the minister to France, became Secretary of State, and General Henry Knox continued as Secretary of War. Although Washington regularly asked for advice from these officials, they weren't called the Cabinet until they started meeting together. An Attorney General and a Postmaster General were also appointed. Washington wanted to ensure people respected his office, so he adopted some royal customs. His journey to the inauguration was like a royal parade with ceremonies, speeches and celebrations. He held regular receptions in a royal style and traveled in an elegant coach with attendants. Congress even debated how to address the president, with John Adams suggesting, and I quote, His Highness, the President of the United States of America and Defender of their Liberties. End of quote. Eventually, they settled on the simple Mr. President, which Washington preferred. Washington's actions set the tone for how future presidents would conduct themselves. By choosing respected individuals like Hamilton and Jefferson, he ensured that the new government had strong leadership. His adoption of certain royal customs, while controversial, helped establish the authority and dignity of the presidency. The debate over how to address the president highlights the struggle to balance respect and simplicity in this new democracy. When the new American government was formed, money was one of the biggest issues. The country needed a reliable way to raise funds to pay its debt and operate effectively. Alexander Hamilton, the first secretary of the treasury, was in charge of managing the public debt. Hamilton had a clear and ambitious vision for the nation's finances and economy, which he outlined in a series of reports to Congress. In January 1790, he introduced his report on the public credit. This report revived Robert Morris's earlier idea of a funded public debt, which means the government would promise to pay back the debt using the revenue from taxes on imports. Hamilton introduced tariffs. A tariff is a tax placed on goods that are bought into a country from abroad. Hamilton proposed tariffs on imported goods, particularly from Europe. These tariffs served two purposes. They generated income for the government and protected budding American industries by making foreign products more expensive, thus encouraging people to buy American-made goods. This was a significant source of revenue for the federal government in the early years since it did not rely heavily on direct taxes on the people. It also supported Hamilton's broader vision of encouraging manufacturing and industrial growth in the US. Hamilton introduced excise taxes on specific domestic produced items such as whiskey. These are taxes paid by producers on goods they create and sell within the country. The most famous example is the Whiskey Tax of 1791, which taxed the production of whiskey. While the tax generated revenue from the government, it was controversial and led to the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794, where farmers who produced whiskey resisted paying the tax. 
However, the government's ability to put down the rebellion showed that it could enforce its tax laws, reinforcing the federal government's authority. Excise taxes were a way to raise money internally without placing direct financial pressure on everyday citizens through income taxes, which did not exist at that time. Hamilton also proposed the issuance of government bonds as a way to raise money. Bonds are essentially loans from citizens to the government. The government would sell bonds to the public, promising to pay them back with interest later. This gave people an incentive to lend money to the government. By issuing bonds, the government could raise large sums of money upfront to pay off debts or finance major projects. This helped stabilize the economy and it also allowed wealthy Americans and foreign investors to have a stake in the success of the federal government. Hamilton's use of bonds wasn't just a way to generate income. It also helped build confidence in the government's financial stability. Hamilton knew that a growing economy meant more income for the government in the long term. By encouraging industrial growth and manufacturing, Hamilton aimed to increase the overall wealth of the, uh, of, of the country, which would indirectly generate more revenue through increased production and trade. While this wasn't an immediate source of income, Hamilton's push for industrialization aimed at creating a self-sufficient economy that could grow, develop new jobs, and increase the wealth of the nation over time. This industrial growth, in turn, would result in more taxable goods and activities in the future. Hamilton's long-term vision for industrialization was crucial for laying the economic foundation for future, uh, future income generation. Hamilton introduced additional financial reforms. After the Revolutionary War, many states vote a lot of money to foreign countries and private creditors. Hamilton's plan was for the federal government to take responsibility for these state debts. Why? He believed it would create a stronger, more unified country because the states would all be tied to the success of the federal government. Some states, particularly in the South, were against this because they had already paid off most of their debts and did not want to uh, be responsible for the debts of other states. By taking on state debts, the federal government gained more power and credibility, showing it uh, that they could manage large amounts of money responsibly. Hamilton proposed the establishment of the Fast Bank of the United States, which would be a central bank. This bank would handle the federal government's money, use paper currency, and give out loans to help the government function. This bank would be chartered for 20 years and have a capital of 20 million. The federal government would own 20% of the bank's shares with private investors buying the rest using gold, silver and new federal bonds. The bank would issue loans to merchants in the form of paper notes that could be exchanged for gold or silver and used to pay taxes. This was controversial because people like Thomas Jefferson argued that the constitution did not give the federal government the power to create a bank. But Hamilton said it was allowed under the necessary and proper clause, meaning the government could do things necessary to fulfill its duties. The fast bank of the United States helped stabilize the economy, but it also sparked debates about how much power the federal government should have. The decision set the stage for future conflicts between those who wanted a stronger central government and those who wanted power to stay with the states. President Washington, after considering both arguments, agreed with Hamilton and signed the bill to create the Bank of the United States in February 1791. Initially, the concept of political parties was viewed negatively. Many believed that factions served self-interest rather than the common good. Ironically, despite criticizing factions in the Federalist Papers, Madison and Hamilton's disagreements over financial policies led to the formation of these very factions. Madison and Jefferson organized opposition to Hamilton's policies, naming their factions the Democratic Republicans, to suggest that their opponents were elitist or monarchist. Hamilton supporters, called Federalists, adopted their name to emphasize their support for the Constitution and a strong central government. Over time, 
the Democratic Republicans evolved into today's Democratic Party, while the Federalist tradition eventually influenced the rise of the modern Republican Party. To promote their views, Madison and Jefferson supported the National Gazette, which criticized Hamilton's policies. In response, Hamilton's allies used the Gazette of the United States to accuse the Republicans of promoting disorder. These media outlets helped solidify the names and ideologies of both parties. Even after resigning from their official roles in the government, both Jefferson and Hamilton continued leading their respective parties. The Federalists and Democratic Republicans organized political events, published newspapers and nominated candidates, solidifying party identities and competition. Now let's move on to discuss the challenges that George Washington faced during his presidency. From the moment he took office in 1789, the geopolitical landscape was fraught with instability. The French Revolution ignited wars across Europe, disrupting American commerce. Meanwhile, Britain continued to influence Native American attacks from forts it occupied in the Ohio Territory despite its defeat in the American Revolution. Domestically, unrest surged due to a controversial legal tax. These combined pressures led many political leaders to suspect their opponents of conspiracy with foreign powers, raising concerns about whether the new government could withstand these trials. However, Washington's administration successfully navigated these threats through decisive diplomatic and military actions that ensured the young nation's stability. The French Revolution initially thrilled Americans who saw it as an extension of their own fight for Republican ideals. However, as the revolution became more radical with the execution of King Louis XVI and Queen Mary Antoinette, Federalists grew increasingly alarmed. They feared that the violence and upheaval in France could undermine the United States' fragile stability. In contrast, Republicans led by Thomas Jefferson remained sympathetic to the French cause, deepening the ideological divide. Despite internal division, Washington steered a careful course. To prevent the US from becoming embroiled in Europe's wars, he issued the Proclamation of Neutrality in 1793, declaring that the United States would remain neutral in the conflict between Britain and France. This action ensured that the young nation avoided a potentially disastrous war, preserving its limited resources for domestic growth. The proclamation also set a precedent for future American foreign policy, emphasizing non-involvement in European conflicts. A major test of Washington's diplomatic stance came with the arrival of Edmund Charles Jeannette, known as Citizen Jeannette in 1793. Sent by the revolutionary French government to secure American support, Janet bypassed diplomatic channels and tried to recruit American citizens to fight for France. His actions violated Washington's proclamation of neutrality and threatened to entangle the US in a war with Britain. Washington acted decisively, demanding Janet's recall and thus reaffirming American neutrality. When the political faction that had sent Jeanette to America fell from power, he remained in the United States as a private citizen. Washington's farm response to the Jeanette Fair reinforced the authority of the presidency and demonstrated that the U.S. would not allow foreign powers to undermine its sovereignty. In addition to diplomatic challenges, Washington's administration faced Native American resistance in the Ohio Territory, where Britain continued to support native tribes despite agreeing to cede the region after the Revolutionary War. The Northwest Confederacy, led by chiefs like Little Turtle, resisted American expansion, inflicting a devastating defeat on U.S. forces in the Battle of the Wawas in 1791. Washington responded by rebuilding the military and creating a stronger, more disciplined force under General Anthony Wayne. In 1794, Wayne's army decisively defeated the Confederacy at the Battle of Fallen Timbers. This victory forced Native American leaders to sign the Treaty of Greenville in 1795, ceding 
vast lands in modern day Ohio, Indiana and Illinois to the US. The treaty solidified American control over the Northwest Territory and removed a major threat to Western expansion. The ongoing European wars also affected American commerce, both with uh, Britain and France seizing American ships. The British in particular not only seized US vessels but also impressed American sailors into their navy. To address these grievances, Washington sent Chief Justice John Jay to negotiate a treaty with Britain. The resulting Jay's Treaty, signed in 1795, prevented war with Britain and secured compensation for American merchants whose ships had been seized. Britain also agreed to vacate its ports in the Northwest Territory. However, the treaty did not address the issue of impressment, and Republicans viewed it as a concession to British interests. Despite the controversy, Jay's treaty stabilized relations with Britain, maintained American neutrality, and ensured continued trade with Britain, which was vital for the young nation's economy. Domestically, Washington faced unrest over a federal tax on liquor, which many frontier farmers saw as an unfair burden. The discontent, discontent culminated in the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, where farmers in western Pennsylvania openly defied the tax and attacked federal officials. This rebellion tested the authority of the federal government. In response, Washington mobilized a militia of 13,000 troops, the largest force he ever commanded, and personally led them to Pennsylvania where the rebellion quickly collapsed without bloodshed. By asserting federal authority, Washington demonstrated that the government had the power to enforce its laws, reinforcing national unity and the rule of law. Through a combination of diplomacy, military force and domestic action, Washington's administration successfully overcame the major challenges of its time. By maintaining neutrality in European conflicts, quelling domestic unrest and asserting control over the western frontier, Washington solidified the power of the federal government and set enduring precedents for American foreign and domestic policy. His leadership ensured that the young republic not only survived its early trials but emerged stronger and more stable.